half baked in the original was meant to. <laughs> um, so I guess I, I know what I was going to say for this slide. Um, when we deal with archaeology, we tend to just deal with the very <coughs> visual elements of this. So whether this is GIS, network analysis, making beautiful 3D models, or, um, or less 3D models to some extent, um, everything we tend to engage with tends to be visual. Unless, obviously, you tend to be an object person where it's a bit more haptic and things like that. Um, but the approach of kind of thinking about how people experience things in the past is, is well, clearly multi-sensory, as everything we do, we interact with the world in kind of multiple different ways, as um, Paul and Stefan were talking about this morning, which really nicely fits in. And I'm definitely a fan of the idea of um, multi-sensory learning. Um, however, oh, that's definitely not the slide I thought it was going to be. Um, however, obviously, uh, more recently, there have been a number of approaches to kind of think about how things sounded in the past. Um, and particularly from the world of building acoustics, um, in terms of modelling and designing or, um, acoustics for buildings that will be built in the future. These same applications we can then um, take and use to kind of, I'm going to use the word reconstruct because it's easier, uh, but reconstruct or consider the experience of sound in the past. Um, so uh, this kind of came out of the word building acoustics. Uh, Professor Wallace Sabine in the, I think it was the 1950s, uh, basically at Harvard, got told to mend the acoustics of this room, this lecture theatre, which uh, it, was imp it, was, it was appalling to talk in, and no one could understand the speaker. Um, he made the link between the size of a space and <coughs> the material properties used in that space are the main things which affect acoustics. And there, from there, he's made a whole series of equations to actually compute those facts. Um, so surface properties include um, how, think, how sound scatters and how it is absorbed in different spaces. Um, I've used this image. I'm also terrified I've got a typo somewhere. Um, this image is of two spaces at University of Southampton. Um, on your left... <coughs> is um, this is a reflecting room, which means all the properties reflect back, and you can begin to analyse how how different material absorbs sound. The space on the right is an anechoic chamber, which is a dead room, which means any recordings undertaken in this space are purely based on what people are saying. There is no response from the room, which will affect your results. Um, and these techniques give us a whole range of like numerical values where we can begin to assess um, the acoustical space. Um, so the acoustical properties of a space. A reverberation time is the one you most commonly hear about, and it's the amount of time it takes um, for a sound to drop 60 decibels. However, just looking at this, and I'm hoping this is the order I meant to talk about this in, um, this is a very visual way of engaging with sound. What we're looking at here, we're looking at it. We're not listening to it, or we're not hearing it, or we're not understanding it in an auditory way. So what I'm trying to, I, I don't know if this is, well, this is to some extent considered a problem because what you see in graphs often is, it's, not a, it's not very clear how that would actually be interpreted or how that would be experienced. So for example, a very small change denoted on a graph could represent something that's not actually audible. Um, we can also uh, create oralizations um, from measurements undertaken in a space. So we can record the acoustical properties of a room by going into that space and uh, exciting it, and we can convolve that with an anechoic recording, so a recording undertaken in a dead room, to create an oralised signal which will allow us to listen to these experiences, which then that is a kind of edging closer to that experience. Yeah, that is a more um, auditory perception approach. Um, this is obviously a very beautiful 3D model that you probably can't see because I don't think the light's working very well, uh, produced by Dr. Neanderthal Anthony Mazington as part of the Virtual St. Stephen's project. Um, and what I'm trying to uh, kind of hypothesise is, or hypothesize, I don't know, talk about, is the idea that, um, that we're experiencing this by looking at it. But this is also the basis of an aud auditory model. As part of the Virtual St. Stephen's project, I was provided a whole series of these images along with some AutoCAD data which may or may not be on the next slide, and it is. <laughs> and uh, these were used as the basis to create an acoustical model, which might be on the next slide, and it is. Oh, this is, this is going well. Um, and these, this model is entirely created from those two very visual models. It's created from survey data combined with um, the material properties I've kind of taken from the re reconstruction produced by Anthony Mazington. This is, um, and that process is very, very visual. 
even though what I'm thinking about when I create this model isn't. So the process to create um, an acoustical model if you're going to model a space that doesn't exist anymore um, it is actually, you, t you undertake the same process you tend to with a visual model. You need to know the space's dimensions, you need to know its furnishings and fittings. And whereas we're not interested in how it like, re reacts to light, whether the texture is such, what we're interested in is how the space responds, so whether it, by, whether it scatters or absorbs sound. So for example in this room, the carpet will absorb sound, the curtains will absorb sound, but all the white beautiful walls means that you can actually hear me broadly, even though I've got a sore throat because that's projecting the voice back. So, yes, so we've created a beautiful acoustical model. Um, I'm going to, I feel it's ridiculous to try and talk about sound without actually playing your sound. So this is an example of an oralisation, and this is an oralisation of a space that does not exist anymore. A speech made by Henry Beaufoy to the House of Commons, 25th of April, 1792, on the slave trade. Show me your command in this law, and in this slave trade, I will show you that command in a state of tenfold aggravation. Give me an instance of guilt, the treasure of the poor, and the slave trade will exhibit instances of that guilt, more in better, more strongly rooted in the ill, diffusing a more malignant poison and spreading the deep and horror. All other injustices, all other modes of desolating nature, of lasting the happiness of man and defeating the purposes of God, lose in comparison with this their very vain character of evil. Okay, so what this oralisation gives us is an understanding of that space that's entirely based on its auditory experience. Um, but taking independently, I suppose, well, we argue a lot of the time that visualisations are ocular-centric. This is essentially oral-centric as well. We're only understanding the space according to what we're listening to, which is a different critique and not related to this paper, I suppose, but still interesting in my opinion. Um, but the mechanisms or the control points, if we're thinking about morph, um, at the points at which we would assess this model are kind of based on more visual elements than we expect. Um, this workflow was meant to be really fancy, and then um, I got roped into doing a social media for TAG, which has been really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Never say yes, or, or volunteer. Um, so I've been a bit distracted. But the idea um, of the workflow of creating an oralisation is actually remarkably similar to the one that you use to create 3D models. You often start with, especially if you're modelling a space, uh, the room's dimensions, or some survey data, or something like that. To this, you often add the furnishings and the fittings. And you ask, does it look okay? Does it look right? Does it look like what I expected are right? You choose the surface properties for oralisation. So I'm choosing, to some extent, what those fabrics are. Um, and then I'm choosing an anechoic sound, and I'm convolving this, and I'm creating, um, and then I'll assess its audibility. So in the same way as when you create a visual model, you often start off with survey data. You add its furnishing and fittings. Does it look right? Then you, you think about the lighting and how that is going to affect it. And you, then you render it, and then you go, oh no, I've made a massive mistake, there's a huge hole in it, or something like that. And you, re you start again, and you assess that. Um, and then you finally get out your at point, and then you decide whether that looks good. Well, in the oralisation, it's broadly the same thing. Except for when we're doing <coughs> visual ones, we are assessing their visual capacities. In, in the auditory world, we are still very assessing the visual elements of the model. We're not assessing necessarily how it sounds until the very last end. So when we're assessing the room dimensions or the furnishings and fittings or we're thinking it look right, those are all very visual engagements with the acoustical model. The surface properties, to some extent, is also visual because I'm assessing what things... I'm kind of making my decisions about what, property, um, what the acoustical properties of various surfaces are and textures are based on what they look like. I know that this is going to reflect because it's, it's, um, it's very flat and shiny. I know a curtain is going to absorb because I know that the texture will take that in. So actually, all of these elements are visual. We're, we're basing our understanding on this on a kind of visual criteria, not how things are sounding to some extent until we reach the audibility. So in the same way, we are recently there's been lots of conversations about the creativity involved with um, uh, creating visualisations of any description. The same is true of um, acoustical modelling. I think in it, I think it, don't think it's something that people are really engaging with as much yet, but they're still the same. And should we be worried that it's visual control factors that are kind of stimulating our choice in models, 
or are we, it's the fact that we're just not engaging with the creative process at all the problem? Or are we just too reliant on visual elements such as the numerical responses or um, how things look to kind of, yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry, that was a bit of a disastrous presentation. Um, and I hope I kind of got my point across that while what I'm creating is clearly auditory, um, the process going, I go, I'm going through to make it is very, very visual. And I'm not sure whether that's a problem or not, or whether it's just something that we should talk about a bit more. But yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs>